Okay, we want to welcome everybody. It looks like we're right at about 102 people. So if you want to tell us what states you're from, if you want to put that in the chat box, um, we welcome everybody. I know we kind of got out of the habit of doing these webinars because we wanted to give you some time to get out in the field and work on all the stuff that we had been talking about. So we appreciate you guys joining us today. Today is a personal treat for me. I have followed Philip Martin's stuff for years and years and years. Um, and he randomly reached out to me over a different project and I wanted to see if he would possibly come and talk with us and he was super gracious to be able to do that. And so I just am very excited for us to learn from him. I feel like um, with migrant education, we really need to learn how to understand more of the data and understand how that directly impacts us and he has a wealth of knowledge. So the way we're going to do this, if you have questions, if you will put them in the chat box. Um, right now, everyone will be muted except for him as we go through this. That way everyone can hear good. We've got now, it looks like there's about 114 of you, so we're all over the country. I just want to make sure that that sound is really good. We will have some time for questions at the end, and so I'll kind of keep track of the questions that you have. If, as you have them, some of them may be answered, but if not, we'll have some time that you can go ahead and, and answer that. So. I'm going to let Philip introduce himself a little bit more, and I'm, again, just super grateful that he has taken some time today to, uh, to talk with us. So I'm going to mute myself and uh, stop my video, um, but I turn the time over to you. Well, thank you, Jessica, and I want to thank everybody who's joined us. What we're going to do is talk for about 30 minutes on highlighting some of the main things that are happening in farm labor right now. And probably the, the overall story is a story that the H-2A guest worker program is increasing in size. And yes, it's going up even in fiscal 2020. And the fact that the U.S. government first deemed uh, farm labor essential and then said that there would be immigration exceptions to bring H-2A guest workers into the U.S. in 2020 really seems to signal that there, that most people in government did not think there would be a big return of non-farm workers uh, to the farm workforce this year. So as Jessica said, I'm Phil Martin. I teach agricultural economics at the University of California at Davis. And I, though I never really intended to study farm labor, I was sort of pushed into the farm labor issues in the early 1980s when the, there was a lot of union activity in California and then came a big wave of unauthorized migration. So I actually did a lot of work in Washington and uh, worked at the Brookings Institution and later with the Domestic Policy Council on what became the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. And then I served on the Commission on Agricultural Workers, which reviewed the impacts of the Immigration Reform and Control Act uh, at a time in the early 1990s when there was a huge influx of people from rural Mexico. But today, what we're going to do is try to move forward here. And Jessica, for some reason, I am frozen with the first slide and cannot make my slides advance. Is there something that you, you need to do to make that happen? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, on the screen. Okay, so the main, the main three sort of takeaway points or background points on this are that we're mostly talking about labor intensive commodities. Those are fruits, vegetables, and what we call horticultural specialties, uh, mushrooms, uh, greenhouse nursery, flowers, and they're roughly one third of U.S. crop sales, but two thirds of U.S. farm employment and wages paid. So most of U.S. agriculture is corn and grains uh, and, and, and other or non-labor intensive agriculture, but that one third that's labor intensive accounts for about two thirds of the total farm employment and wages paid. We don't really have terribly good data on farm labor, but the best sort of way to think about it is that the average employment in crops and then what's also called crop support is a little over a million. So what is average employment? Average employment is like a McDonald's that has 20 slots. So when it's operating, you've got a certain number of people in the cashiers and in the kitchen and everything else, and you have 20 slots. 
it's not the number of people who work at the McDonald's every year. In fact, turnover at McDonald's is a little over 100%. And that means in order to keep 20 people working, they have to hire 40 people in the course of the year. That's the same in agriculture. In order to have 1.1 million average jobs, you typically have to hire two uh, workers. So it's a little over 2.2 million then would be a guess as to how many unique farm workers there are. Who are those farm workers? Well, about 90% are, not quite 90%, it's actually 70%, but most typical is a 42-year-old unauthorized Mexican-born man with a, with, with a family settled in the United States with U.S.-born children. About 30% of farm workers are women. About 30% were actually born in the United States or Puerto Rico. But if you were thinking of who's most typical, it would be early 40-year-old unauthorized man born in Mexico. The growth, as it were, the fresh blood in the workforce is from H-2A guest workers. They're on average about 32 years old. They tend to be concentrated in the heaviest harvesting jobs, whether it's harvesting citrus in Florida or apples in Washington or other commodities. And that's, that's been the big story of what's been changing. This year, of course, we're dealing with COVID-19. And that has sort of, there's three big things to keep in mind. One is labor costs are going up. They're going up because it's more costly for employers. The H-2A program has expanded, as I already said, and prices for many commodities for farmers are down. So, so far, so far we have not seen a big influx of non-farm workers seeking seasonal farm jobs. There's been some movement back into agriculture, not a lot. We won't really know till next year, till the data are out. But the minimum wage went up in a lot of states. Farmers are buying personal protective equipment. And of course, using H-2A is typically more expensive because of housing costs. And the net effect of this idea of rising labor costs means there's a race in the fields as to whether we're going to have in 2030 machines or H-2A guest workers or imports out there. And the answer really is it's going to vary a lot by commodity. In a commodity like raisin grapes, we'll probably mechanize. In a commodity like strawberries, we'll probably have more H-2A workers and more imports. And in a commodity like tomatoes, uh, we will probably shrink. It's already true that 61% of all the tomatoes available in the U.S. are imported, mostly from Mexico. So in 2020, the blue lines on these graphs are the 2020, the red lines are 2019, and the green are 2018. And what you can see is that, in general, we are looking at prices that are not higher in 2020, and in the case of strawberries, lower in 2020 than in previous years. So what that means is that in, in, in at least early in the pandemic, you saw stories of farmers plowing under fields or throwing away produce or farmers dumping milk. That has somewhat stabilized uh, and remember, many commodities that are in, in orchards or vineyards, they'll be harvested as long as the price to the grower covers the cost of harvesting. But what seems to be happening is that there's less fresh produce being bought, part, be, partly because restaurants are closed, but also because people are making fewer shopping trips to the store. And when they go, they tend to take a list so they don't buy uh, uh, as many fresh produce items for fear they may go bad before they are eaten. They're buying more, more processed foods, and that is what is putting some downward pressure on fresh produce prices in some regions of the country. Farm worker employment increases in the spring and it peaks in the summer. The peak is typically uh, July, August, September. And if you look at the lines, you'll notice the light blue line at the bottom is average employment in animal agriculture. The line right above it is what is called crop support. And we'll use that term several times. And what that means is it's a non-farm employer who brings workers to a farm. The most typical crop support is a farm labor contractor. 
but there are also custom harvesters for grains and for cotton. And there are firms that apply fertilizers or plant seeds from airplanes, things like that. So it's not just labor contractors, but it's mostly labor contractors. And then of course, the dark line at the top are farmers who, who hire workers directly, crop farmers who hire workers directly. So farm wages are rising. Historically, the average hourly earnings in agriculture were about half of the average hourly earnings of non-farm workers. And so that green line shows that it actually was below half back in the early 1990s when there was a big influx of unauthorized workers from Mexico. It went between 50 and 60% for most of the last several decades. And starting about 2017, it's now gone above uh, 60%. So we're, it came down a little bit uh, between 2018 and 2019. But the, the general trend is that since recovery from the 2008-2009 recession, uh, average hourly earnings in agriculture have actually been rising a little faster than average hourly earnings in the non-farm sector. When we look at agriculture, we know there are about 35 so-called NAICSCOs, North American Industry Classification System. And it's only five of them really count when it comes to labor. So what are they? Well, the largest single payment of wages in agriculture is for crop support. And as I said, that is mostly labor contractors, but it also involves some custom harvesters and other things. The second is cattle and dairy. That's mostly dairy, more than beef cattle, uh, ranching and feedlots, but it's fairly important. It's year round work. And remember, this is wages, not employment. And because workers in dairies, for example, tend to be employed year round, they account for about 13% of wages. Next comes fruits and nuts. Uh, they employ a lot of seasonal labor, especially for pruning and thinning and harvesting. After that comes greenhouses. Those jobs are often year round. And then finally comes vegetables. Now, one important point to make is that if, we, if, a person, if a labor contractor brings workers to a farm, we don't know what commodity they worked in. Because we know that a lot of the people on fruit farms or on vegetable farms were brought there by labor contractors. But all that the data tell us is that that farmer used a labor contractor to get workers. And that's, uh, that's all we know. We know that it's a crop support service. So we know that labor contractors are about half of all the crop support service employment in US agriculture is about two thirds in, in California. And one statistic that always stands out is the average employment of a labor contractors in California is larger than the total employment in agriculture in all states except California. So in other words, if you see a crew of people working in a field in California, chances are they were brought there by a non-farm labor contractor rather than hired directly uh, by the farm where they're working. So the farm labor contractors employ an average of about 20% of all the people employed in crops. They're the, the number one employer and of course, they vary enormously across states. Florida and California are two states that make extensive use of labor contractors. They're, they're less used, let's say, on smaller farms in North Carolina or in the Washington uh, apple industry. But of course, labor contractors have a very mixed reputation. There are very good labor contractors. There are also very bad labor contractors. And of course, one of the reasons why labor contractors figure so prominently in discussions of ag labor is that sometimes some of the worst abuses we find in farm labor are associated with labor contractors. If we look at where employment is across commodities, apples are probably the number one employer because there are so many acres of them. And they employ an average of about 85,000 workers and many apple growers do hire workers directly. There are labor contractors in apples, but many are workers are hired directly. The big change in the apple industry has been to go toward dwarf trees, high density, fruiting walls. And with fruiting walls, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, you can 
switch from ladders to some kind of hydraulic platform, uh, eventually there's a lot of efforts to try to mechanize those harvestings. Washington stands out as the, the big apple state, and it is the place where there's been the mo where there's a lot of hiring of uh, uh, workers, both local and people who move into the state, uh, as well as a lot of efforts to save on labor with some sort of mechanization or mechanical aids. What the government calls non-apple, non-citrus. So this is, it's not an apple tree, it's not an orange tree, it's not a grapefruit tree, but it's a peach tree or an apricot tree or a pear tree, is the second biggest employer. And so think of peaches as a typical one, although it's not, you know, peaches, nectarines, uh, they employ lots of workers and in the non-citrus, non-apples are spread through many states so that unlike apples where Washington dominates, California is the largest, but also South Carolina, Georgia, other places also produce uh, uh, these commodities as you can see on the map. California stands out for having the largest dollar sales of peaches, but we've got a range of states in the East Coast and the Midwest that also produce. Grapes, we come back once more toward California because the, uh, the grapes uh, employ rough almost 30,000 workers and it's heavily dominated by California. Table grapes, raisin grapes, and wine grapes. Wine grapes are almost all mechanically harvested. Table grapes are uh, picked in the field, packed in the field. Raisin grapes are one of those things that will likely mechanize. Strawberries are also a major employer. They're concentrated in California and Florida, but it's, been in, it's, it's an industry that expanded a lot. Now the acreage is going down somewhat, but they're planting high yield varieties. So actually employment has been fairly stable even with acreage going down. Once again, it's a state where California uh, dominates and Florida comes in next. If we look at vegetables and melons, they are much more dispersed across the United States. So in terms of sales, California is about a third. Florida is next, then comes Arizona. And in vegetables, there's both direct hiring and workers brought to farms by labor contractors. Among the vegetables, lettuce is the major one, and then comes tomatoes. And the story in both California and Florida have roughly the same acreage of what are called mature green tomatoes. They're roughly 28,000 acres in each state. But Florida's tomatoes are harvested in the winter months when prices are higher. California's are harvested in the summer months when prices are lower. So even though the workforces are fairly similar, the revenue is much larger in Florida than it is in California. And then the final of these big five are the uh, greenhouse and nurseries, uh, which have employ a lot of people, many of them year round, but it's a sector that is really dispersed throughout the U.S. I mean, the biggest state, remember we're looking at different states here, and now California is the biggest, a little bigger than Florida, but still only one-sixth. The picture in the lower right shows cannabis production, which is taking over the greenhouses that used to grow flowers, and the flower, U.S. flower industry was knocked out by imports, and now increasingly uh, those old greenhouses are being repurposed for cannabis. So who are the workers? The workers are aging. They're unauthorized. They're settled in one place uh, in the U.S. It's hard to get temporary housing. So when workers can find housing, they tend to stay in one place. Uh, many, many of the workers are getting older. So it used to be that, that one would say a, it's hard to find a farmer who's under 40 because of the capital required to operate a big farm. It's hired to find a farm worker over 40 because of the physical demands of the job. That's changing because the average age, this data is a few years old, the average age of US crop workers in the National Agricultural Worker Survey is about 42. And that is actually the median age of all workers in the United States. So it's no longer true that hired farm workers tend to be much younger than non-farm workers. Most of the unauthorized farm workers who are roughly half of the crop workers in the NAWS are settled in the United States. Many of them have US born children. Many of them want to continue in agriculture. And 
Of course, one reason is, is that they have relatively low levels of education. The average educational level of adults in Mexico is about nine years. The average educational level of Mexican-born workers employed in U.S. agriculture is around eight years. So the people who came from Mexico and who are employed in U.S. agriculture tend to be, have less education than the average Mexican. And that's one of the reasons why many of them say that working in agriculture is what they would like to do. So what happens in 2020? Well, COVID-19, among other things, raises costs, labor costs. There is the cost for not just for protected personal equipment, but it's also if an employer is providing housing, making sure that the, uh, uh, there's a bit more distancing in the housing or having isolation facilities so someone gets sick. There's the way of transportation with not being as crowded. Uh, it's important to remember that in some commodities, there were already requirements to have face masks and wear gloves for food safety reasons. So in some of the lettuce harvesting, et cetera, it's, it wasn't totally new to come up with some forms of protective personal equipment. And what many employers are doing in 2020 is they're trying to isolate workers in a particular group. The theory is, as you know, much farm workers organized into crews and crew sizes can go anywhere from 10 to 60 in the strawberry industry. And what many employers are doing is saying, I wanna keep a group of 15 or 30 workers together, both for working, for transport, and if the employer's providing housing for living and not let them interact with each other so that if there is an outbreak, it's confined to one crew as opposed to spreading throughout the crews. That doesn't work terribly well. And you've heard cases of, especially in H2A housing, people play soccer, people get together on weekends, and there have been some big outbreaks. But that's one strategy that some people are doing. But what COVID-19 is likely to do is to accelerate three trends that were already underway. So it's not that COVID started these, but accelerate trends already underway as agriculture has been adjusting for the last decade to this idea of higher labor costs that are likely to go further. And those three are mechanization, guest workers, and imports. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes on each of these to sort of highlight that it, in every case, as labor costs go up, employers try to save money, but the response is going to vary a lot by commodity. So of course, the first response to rising labor costs is to try to mechanize. And the big effort in mechanization so far has been in what are called pre-harvest tasks. So typically they plant too many seeds and then they go through and thin the lettuce, the lettuce plants so that the lettuce that's produced produces bigger heads. Uh, there's a lot of thinning in grapes. There's a lot of thinning in tree fruit. In nurseries, there's a lot of moving of plants as they reach various maturity levels. So the first effort is to try to substitute machines for people. And where many of those efforts are focused on is so far pre-harvest as opposed to harvest. Of course, harvest is typically the largest single labor user. And the, the, the biggest problem with harvesting many fresh fruits and vegetables is that you have to replan, reorient the whole system. So in processing tomatoes, which was the big success story of UC Davis back in the 1960s, they had to change the plant and the tomato, had to make the tomatoes ripen uniformly, had to make them oblong so that when they were together in a big, in a big truck, they wouldn't all squeeze together, had to make it a firmer tomato. Then they had to develop a machine that would go through the field one time, shake off the tomatoes, eventually use electronics to sort, and that's what spurred that. But what that meant was, instead of you having 10 or 20 acres of tomatoes alongside other things, you had to specialize. You had to be a big tomato farmer in order to justify spending three or $400,000 on a machine. And 
what we got as a result was fewer and larger tomato farms. That same process, I mean, there's only two or three carrot growers in the United States. When you mechanize a commodity, it requires a whole lot of changes, not just putting a machine out in the fields, but it requires changes starting from plant breeding all the way through to how the commodity is picked and packed and processed. There's a huge difference. A lot of the work in mechanization or robotics is done at Carnegie Mellon. When you go to visit the people there, they get, most of their money comes from the military. And they say there's a huge difference between agriculture and the military. In the military, it's all about performance, not about cost. If it costs $10 million, but you save a soldier's life, you do it. In agriculture, it's all about cost. It's not about performance. So this little $30,000 device that moves plants in the nursery, the reason that it is spreading is because it is the cheapest electronics that you can get. It is stripped out everything expensive and made it cheap so that it can go 24 seven and move plants from one spot to another. So taking, right now there's a big wave of interest in mechanizing in agriculture. And the engineers say that one of the hardest things to do is to get across to engineers now that it's all about reducing the cost and making sure that machine is durable, that it can work under field conditions as opposed to in a lab. One big problem with mechanization in many of the commodities is the market is too small. I mean, take asparagus. Suppose you developed a machine to pick asparagus. As you know, it grows very fast, has to be harvested several times a week uh, during the peak. Even if you develop the perfect machine, and it's hard to develop the perfect machine, you would never sell very many of them because there simply aren't that many acres of asparagus still left in the United States. Most of our asparagus is imported a lot from Peru uh, these days. And so one problem that confronts mechanization in agriculture is that the, pro the technical problems are difficult and the market is too small to attract a lot of investment. So what does that then leave as an option? Instead of mechanization, you can hire guest workers. And as we've seen, there's been a huge growth in the program and the program is growing again this year. And it's important probably to keep in mind that while there are H-2A workers in every state, five states have well over half of the total, starting with Florida and ending with North Carolina. Uh, and the H-2A workers are much younger than the current U.S. workers. Remember, 94% of H-2A workers come from Mexico, and about 70% of all you have the NAS crop workers come from Mexico. So what we have is a younger group of legal H-2A guest workers and an older group, which are mostly unauthorized uh, workers from Mexico. And there are a lot of tensions in areas that have both H-2A and U.S. workers. The, modern, the Salinas area of California is an example. If you're an H-2A worker, you are you get free housing and there's no tax deductions made from your wages. If you're a U.S. worker, you typically have to provide housing. And remember, most agriculture, most labor intensive agriculture is in metro counties, not in the rural counties, in metro counties. And housing costs can be very high. So if you take the example of the fair market value rent, in the Monterey County, even if you're earning $15 an hour, you're going to be giving up three-fourths of your earnings for 40 percentile rent, which is why you have all of this housing in backyards and other places, because these are expensive places to live, even if they are agricultural areas. From the point of view of employers, if you're hiring H-2A workers, at least on the West Coast, by the time one pays for recruitment, transportation, housing, and other things, the cost is typically over $20 an hour. So H-2A workers are typically more expensive than U.S. workers. But there's a big difference, of course, that in the H-2A program, the employer is selecting the workers. 
and they use what we often call positive networks. You find the best worker in the crew and ask them to bring the friends and relatives. And of course, if I bring somebody new into the crew, I'm gonna feel responsibility for him or her. The US worker, on the other hand, selects the employer because the US worker goes and applies for the job. And in the strawberry crews, for example, where we have 60 people out in the fields, you often notice that there's older workers and there's younger workers. So the productivity, they get paid by piece rates, the productivity uh, difference can be very big. And you, if you look at the payroll records and say, what's happening here? Well, the, the farmer will say, in order to get those 30-year-old fast pickers, I have to hire the 60-year-old uncles because they all carpool together. And so you wind up getting a much bigger, uh, the, the, the productivity of the H2A workers tends to be very similar because they're young men picked to work fast. The productivity of the US workers is more variable. There's also an insurance aspect. I mean, the H2A work, the far, the, 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 you can say that the H2A workers are indentured, you can say they're loyal, but the bottom line is they're gonna be there to go to work and the, the US workers may or may not show up. So we've looked at mechanization, we looked at H2A, now the third and the final one is imports. Remember half of US fresh fruit and a third of US fresh vegetables are imported. And Mexico of course supplies roughly half of the fresh fruit and three fourths of the fresh vegetables. So imports are rising and they, they're going to most likely continue rising. And from Mexico, the big three agricultural exports are tomatoes, avocados, and berries uh, of all kinds, but especially blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries. And, and so we send to Mexico corn, soybeans, and meat, they send to the United States um, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables, including tomatoes and avocados. One important thing is, is that Mexico has something of a latecomer advantage. So in Mexico, many of the vegetables produced for the United States are produced in what's called plastic culture. It's not necessarily a real greenhouse. It can be a plastic covered hoop structure or a metal structure. But what happens within this protected culture farming is you get much higher yields, there's more food safety, the job becomes more like a, a factory rather than a farm. And some of them are height, some of them are, are hydroponics, et cetera. Uh, but the, you know, in other words, you're putting a big investment into a building, but then after that, you're getting much less pest pressure, much less disease pressure, and it's much easier to do organic and everything else. And so the, this, these, these, some of them are greenhouses, some of them are just protective structure, but that's spreading fairly rapidly. And that's why Mexico now is the world's largest exporter of tomatoes. About 70% of those greenhouse type protective culture structures are devoted to tomatoes. Remember back in 1990, the Mexican president said that Mexico will either export tomatoes or tomato pickers to the United States. And it took longer than Mr. Salinas expected, but Mexico is now a major exporter of tomatoes. And it's highly likely that the mature green tomato industry in, South, in Southern Florida and in the Central Valley, California is going to continue shrinking as Mexican exports go up. We do have an, a replacement for NAFTA, the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Uh, and it really doesn't change much in agriculture. We don't have to get into it here, but the Florida growers sued the Mexican growers for dumping tomatoes in the United States. And the so-called tomato suspension agreement, which has been around, it's renewed every few years, that suspends the Florida growers suit as long as Mexico, Mexican exporters charge a minimum price. What it really does is guarantee the Mexican exporters a minimum price, which allows them to invest in things like protected culture and therefore makes them more competitive over time. So to sum up, we had 30 years of lots of farm labor, roughly between 1980 and 2010. We're now in a, a time of transition. There's this race between machines, migrants and imports. On the machine side, it's a question of Will the engineers and the biologists solve the technical issues? Will consumers accept 
the machine harvested produce? Will some farmers like raisin growers get out of producing raisins, which aren't very profitable, instead switch to almonds, which are more profitable and also less need of less labor? On migrants, remember the Bracero program peaked in 1956 at about 450,000 in a workforce then that was larger than it is now. H2As are now, now about 10%. So the Bracero has peaked at 20%. So one in five US farm workers was a Bracero. Now H2As are about one in 10 of US crop workers. And then the imports we already mentioned, they're already significant, they're growing. And so if we look back in the 1960s, half century ago, the big transition was from Braceros to US workers or to the United, and that's when we had the United Farm Workers. There weren't Braceros, United Farm Workers won its big wage increases, 40% wage increase in its first contract in 1966, and we had a lot of mechanization. In the 2020s, we're going to be moving from maybe from unauthorized foreigners to H2A guest workers, machines, and imports. It's hard to say exactly. You know, I often get asked the question, well, what's the best place to invest? Do I invest in a machine to replace workers? Do I invest in housing for H2A workers? Or do I invest in a partner abroad so that I can produce abroad and import? Notice there's not ever the question of, should I invest in trying to recruit US workers? And the problem is, it's really hard to see. I mean, 10 years from now, it will be easy to see what the right strategy was. Right now, it's very hard to see. So that's what I've had to say. If you want to read more of this, there is a new publication from the Giannini Foundation. Giannini um, was the, from the uh, guy who started the Bank of America and uh, supports agricultural economics research. So it looks at a bunch of the major labor intensive crops. And then on the website, migration.ucdavis.edu, there's quite a bit of information as well. So let me stop there and see if I can answer any questions. I have a quick question before anybody puts in comments. Um, you mentioned the flower industry just kind of going south. Um, any backstory on that as far as, I know you mentioned it's due to imports, but just as there were, because a lot of us work with, you know, with nurseries. I actually live in the nursery capital, supposedly, of the world, and I just wondered kind of what the story is with that. Well, the, the U.S. Flower, fresh flower industry was basically killed by the efforts to develop an alternative to drugs in Colombia, Peru, and other countries. So uh, I, there's there, most of the fresh flowers uh, that are bought in the U.S. are imported a lot through Miami. And um, the, the flower industry it still exists. I, I was just looking at average employment in U.S. flowers is something like 6,000. So there still are, are flower greenhouses, but they have had a very, very hard time competing with imports. So an awful lot of the fresh flowers sold in Europe are flown up from Ethiopia to Amsterdam. And a lot of those in the United States are flown up from South America into Miami and then distributed. So it's, it's not that the industry has totally disappeared, but the nursery industry, whether it's trees for farmers to plant or nursery products for homeowners, which is the bigger market, to sell at Home Depot or Lowe's or something, that has expanded uh, a lot. But there, I think there's relatively few people who think that there will be a comeback of the fresh flower industry in the United States. Okay, very interesting. If you guys wanna put your, um, your questions that you have in the chat box and then we can, if you have any questions there, I wanna say that the information, um, it says, what do you anticipate for the trend in wages? One of your slides showed that increasing. I mean, I think that the trend in wage, you know, the trend in wages is likely to continue going up, primarily because the minimum wage in the states with much of the labor intensive agriculture are, are scheduled to go up. So California's minimum wage is scheduled to go up to $15 an hour um, by 2022. Washington's minimum wage is, is it goes up automatically. So many, many states have state minimum wages that will continue going up. And 
when you couple rising state minimum wages with new overtime requirements, um, paid break requirements, the, the direction of labor cost is up. Now, what's going to happen is that there are still a lot of states which have the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. And so we're going to get in a, a situation in the United States where the gap between the highest minimum wages and the lowest minimum wages are going to be two to one. We've never had that before. Um, the, in the nursery industry, as you were saying, generally, you want to produce the plants near where they're going to be planted um, because of climatic reasons. Oregon is a little different because <clears throat> the Willamette Valley allows you to produce plants that can be planted in a whole range of climates, but there's a big, always a big complaint that the wages are so much higher in Oregon than they are in some other states. So <clears throat> we don't really know what's going to wind up happening. But the, the trend so far has been rising labor cost. And we think that's going to continue. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there's this big interest in mechanization or what some other alternative might be. We had another question on any information you have about labor on the needs of for fish farms, like aquaculture. So whenever we get into the relatively small employment sectors, they're important in particular areas, but they're not important nationally, then the data we have is much less. So for example, there's often huge interest in horse farms. And there are a lot of horse farms, but they don't employ many people. And the same is true of both aquaculture and fishing. Uh, there, there are data on how many people are employed in both aquaculture and in fishing. I mean, most of the wild fish caught are up in Alaska. And so there, there, there is a seasonal influx every year for that. But if you, if you look at the, the easiest thing to look at is the something called the QCW, Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages. And um, they have a website. They will show you in detail by state and sometimes by county what the employment is in very, very detailed commodities. You can separate out, for example, the freezing of vegetables from the canning of vegetables in a particular state and county. And they separate out aquaculture from um, uh, you know, wild, fishing for wild fish. But the, the employment in those sectors is relatively small. And, and that's why they don't, they're not included, well, animal workers are not included in the National Agricultural Worker Survey. And there's relatively little information on the characteristics of the workers employed in those sectors. We had a, thank you, that's good information. The, you said the, it's the quarterly census of employment, the QWC or QCW? QCEW. Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages. It's the basic source of information on average employment in a sector and average weekly wages in a sector. That's interesting. That's, a, that's something I really want to look into because I think that's, you know, we're not sure even sometimes where I even find that. Um, well, if you write me out send you the link and you can send it to everybody else. Right. Somebody just put in bls.gov, Miriam put CEW on there. So that, 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 that's, the, that's the website. Okay. We've got another question. It says, um, let's see, it says, if I'm not mistaken, California has a union and other states don't. I do know that currently H-2A workers in Florida are being paid more an hour than the local worker in the community. Is this true for all other states? Okay, so the story of unions in agriculture, there's actually a book uh, out on this, is usually much ado about nothing. We have two, you know, we have a lot of worker advocate groups out there. there there's, there's more than two, but there's two sort of dominant unions, the United Farm Workers in California 
in the Farm Labor Organizing Committee in Ohio and North Carolina. The UFW in California has about 7,000 members and it's, it's been around since the early 1960s. Uh, its largest single contract is with DiRigo, a, a big uh, lettuce grower in Salinas. It represents workers in mushrooms, uh, but it, it, it really has only, let's say about 20 or 25 contracts. And it's in an uphill battle because it's been difficult for the UFW to create lasting agreements. So they get an agreement and maybe to settle um, uh, some labor law violations or something. And then it's been difficult for the UFW to renegotiate the agreement. And so, so, so UFW is still there. They're still very well known. Um, but most of their income actually comes from grants, not from dues that workers pay. The Farm Labor Organizing Committee has roughly the same number of members. Uh, many of the, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee's members are H-2A guest workers, especially in North Carolina. And it has much lower income because it relies on the dues from workers. And in North Carolina, it's a right to work state. So people don't have to join the union if they don't want to and pay dues. So those are the two that you think about. There's also a Berry Workers Union uh, up in, in Washington. There's a, there's a union in Oregon that represents workers. There's, so there's a, it's not just UFW and o, o, uh, um, the flock. And there's also something like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida, which is, it's technically called a workers center, not a union. A union has to report uh, its membership and its dues and its income uh, to the Bureau of Labor Statistics or to the Department of Labor every year. A workers center does not. But the, the CIW advocates on behalf of workers. So I, I'd say that the big dynamic in, that's going on in farm labor is not so much unions, but these, what I would call private certification efforts. And so a private certification or private labor law certification effort would be the CIW. They have a fair food program. So they pressure the buyers of tomatoes to ensure that the growers of those tomatoes recognize the CIW as the workers advocate, abide by a series of rules, and then pay a little bit more, the buyer pays a little bit more for the tomatoes and the money flows back to uh, workers. The Fair Trade USA is starting to get into agriculture. They'll come out with a new dairy standard soon. And they will then audit farms. So, and so then the CIW has an affiliate that audits the farms. They solicit complaints, audit farms, make sure they're in compliance. Equitable Food Initiative, uh, Fair Trade USA, other groups are involved as well. And the, and the idea is basically that a farm employer satisfies the standards of the certifier. And in return, then the farm gets preferred access to the buyer. So, you know, if you're selling to Costco and you're EFI certified, then you'll get preferred access to sell to Costco, or you might get a slightly higher price uh, when you're selling. And since the marketplace is very competitive, farm suppliers will do what they can to gain an edge. And so that, that's, that's sort of what, what is happening. And there's probably more of that kind of activity the, that is the private certification activity than there is union activity at this time. Okay. Well, there is another question about what shortages of fruits, vegetables, or ag products do you expect due to COVID-19? Okay, it's a good question. And, and there really, there were a lot of disruptions in the supply chain early on, as we all know from toilet paper and other things. But now we're not really talking much about shortages. We're mostly talking about surpluses of commodities. So for the price of blueberries, for example, was way down this year. Uh, and, and so in, in many, in most of the commodities, 
if we look at the data on how much is being shipped and what the prices are, the shipments of watermelons and cantaloupes are similar in 2020 to years before, but prices in some cases are significantly lower. And as I was saying before, I think some of that is that consumers are, might be a little reluctant to purchase fresh produce if they fear they won't get it eaten before it spoils. And, and with more online delivery, uh, I mean, you may not see that display of raspberries at the end of the corner and pick one up. And so you're less likely to order something like raspberries than you would if you physically went to the store. And if you go to the store and you have a mask and you've got a list, you're not really looking around at what might be there. So I don't know that I've heard many stories of shortages of particular commodities. If anything, I think what's in the industry is that with the restaurants, with food service, everything from cafeterias to restaurants to airlines and everybody else who might buy food, with that demand down, there's just a downward pressure on the prices of many of the commodities this year. Uh, uh, so not so much shortages, but people complaining of low prices. That makes complete sense. That, that's something I, when, when all this first started happening, people kept talking about two complete different food systems and we really hadn't thought, well, you know, there are farmers that are specifically for restaurants and, you know, you just, we in our, you know, migrant ed community were just, talking to the farmer, we may not know where on earth their, their produce ends up or what, but we just know that they have it. And I think we're seeing now a lot more in our local communities of which group they were tied to or exactly what you're saying, who's having these you know, surpluses that can't afford to pay workers because their product's not worth as much now because of the spiral of that. So I think that, I think you're, you hit that right on. Um, anybody, are there any more questions? Or yeah, I'm not seeing my lips, I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss one. Um, See, so far, I think, I think that's, that's what I got two more here. Let's see. It says, are, are H-2A workers replacing immigrant undocumented workers, accommodating growth, labor, demand, or both? Okay, so what impact do H-2A workers have? I mean, this is hard because in theory, in order for me to hire an H-2A worker, I have to be certified by the Department of Labor that there's not an able, willing, and available U.S. worker and that there will be no adverse impacts on U.S. workers of hiring an H-2A worker. So that certification process is supposed to ensure there is no displacement of U.S. workers, that H-2A workers enter only when there's a job that can't be filled by U.S. workers as opposed to H-2A workers enter and displace a U.S. worker. Now we know that it may not work in practice, but in theory, H-2A workers should have no negative impacts on U.S. workers. This is what I think actually happens in practice. H-2A workers are more expensive, but once a grower gets familiar with the H-2A program, they tend to stick with H-2A workers. There are relatively few examples that I'm aware of, of a grower hiring H-2A workers, let's say five years in a row, and then saying, I'm gonna go back to US workers. There are examples of trying it one year, being sued for violations of the regulations, and then getting out of the H-2A program. But after people are in the H-2A program five or more years, they tend to stick with H-2A. And then, when H-2A ends, it's almost always due to mechanization or imports. Florida sugarcane is a good example. The, the, they didn't call them H workers, but they started arriving from Jamaica to hand cut to sugarcane south of Lake Okeechobee back in the 19, during World War II. And the, pro, and, and, and the, H, the, the, the program ended because the H-2A workers filed a class action suit saying they were underpaid and a state judge agreed with them, and there was a huge back wage liability. And so in the end, the, the cases were complicated, but in the end, the growers won many of the cases, but still 
the idea is that if we have to pay this much for hand cutting the sugar cane, we're going to switch to machines. So now there's still an industry there and it's mechanized. And, you know, the, that processing tomato industry was heavily reliant on Braceros before it was mechanized in the 1960s. So the, the H2A program is spreading. And I think that what warrants a lot more attention is it's spreading in different ways. So in Florida and in California, it's labor contractors. I mean, remember, half of all H2A workers are employed by labor contractors. And so in Florida and in California, we have labor contractors who've got 4,000 or 5,000 H2A workers, and they take them, they make a contract with a farm to get the lettuce picked or whatever else, the strawberries picked. And, and so it's a contractor-based H2A program in those states. In North Carolina and Washington, it's much more of a, an employer association-based program. So the employer in Idaho, the employers form an association. That association handles the recruitment and the transportation, and then the association sends workers to individual farms. That's also the way the programs work in Canada. Uh, so, so what we don't know is the implications for the workers of the two different systems. I mean, which is better? Is it better to come through the association that has a supposedly a nonprofit association, usually that has an incentive to get workers in as efficiently as possible and then get them to the farms where they're going to work? Or is it the labor contractor model where remember labor contractors then are still trying to make a profit uh, after they get paid by farmers and turn around and pay workers. So, so the H-2A program is something that is expanding a lot. It's something that deserves a lot more scrutiny, I think, than what it's getting. Uh, but it's one where we really don't have, I mean, there are examples, as I said, once, once employers tend to use H-2A, they tend not to return to U.S. workers. And what we don't know is what happens to ex-farm workers? We just don't have good information. We do know that it's more difficult, it's a more difficult job as workers get older. The farm worker has become a lot easier in many cases because of conveyor belts out in the field, harvesting aids, that kind of thing. But still, it, uh, studying the expansion and the impact of the H-2A program and what it means for US workers is something that deserves a lot more study. Well, I, one comment I want to make is over the years, we've seen a lot of just a shortage of farm workers. And so that, you know, there's a lot of data out that was just talking about how many, you know, how many farms just can't find the labor. And so a lot of times H2A seems as the promising answer to, you know, here I can have, you know, specific workers that I know. We've got a couple more questions. One says, um, what other countries from Central America have been approved for the H2A program? Oh, there's, you can go on the website, there's 60 countries from which you can recruit H2A and H2B workers. So okay. Guatemala, most of this. It's just that if you're, if you're recruiting guest workers, you tend to use networks. You find a good worker and then ask that worker to refer their friends and relatives. And so it's difficult for a new country to break into the guest worker programs for low-skilled workers. That's why almost, you know, over 90% of both H2 and a, H2A and H2B guest workers come from Mexico. The transportation is cheaper, cheaper, they can use buses, and um, uh, the networks are in place. But there are 60-some countries that are on the list. You, you actually just answered the next question, I think, pretty well. It says, the next one says, I see a tendency of the same H2A workers come back to the same farm year after year. Will you theorize on why this is happening? It's because usually farmer, what farmers tend to say is that, remember many of the commodities that guest workers are working in the United States, they don't have in their own country. So it's not as if they're experienced workers. And typically they say it takes two or three years for a guest worker to reach maximum productivity and then uh, um, and, you know, and, and in the East Coast, I must say, some of the Jamaican apple pickers are in their 60s um, on those smaller apple farms. But in general, 
you know, doing harvest work in agriculture has typically been, has been more likely to be a 10 year job than a lifelong career. And so I suspect that you'll get quite a few guest workers who will return 10, maybe even 20 years, but I'd be surprised if we'll see a whole lot in their 60s or 70s. Yeah. Well, we have just about finished our time. We did, um, we had another question that I believe you've already answered it. They asked what fruits and vegetables might need due to short supply, but we've already kind of talked about that. Um, I really want to thank you for your time today. I feel like you're just a wealth of knowledge <laughs> that we could, there was one question and maybe we could have this as our final question. There was a suggestion on like, do you have any thoughts on migrant ed? And I wanted to add to that question of, we're all out in the business trying to find farm workers and trying to then provide services. So if you were a migrant recruiter, knowing all that you know of all the connections that you have, um, besides just going directly to farms, what other networks do you think that we should be tapping into that maybe is something that you know we're not we might not be thinking about or might not be? Well, I think the hardest thing for migrant ed is that you've done a good job of teaching people that moving families around is not good for the children's education. And so we run across a lot of workers who we call solo males, but that doesn't mean they're not married. It just means they're working without their families. So the question is then, how do you, you know, where do you look for those families? And, and of course that, that varies. I mean, the hardest thing to find is low cost, stable housing in many of the agricultural areas of the United States. And, and so I'll give you an example. If you work in Napa, the wine country, you'll earn 18 or $20 an hour. The problem is the apartments are extremely expensive. So people will commute into Napa up to two hours each way for those higher wages. And so, you know, by interviewing the workers in Napa, you won't necessarily find their families because their families are in Stockton or in Woodland or in Yuba City or so one of the other towns. Now, I don't know enough about the definitions of the program, whether the child has to migrate with the parent to be eligible or whatever. But I think the harder, you know, the thing to keep in mind is increasingly what we're seeing is long commutes from stable housing as opposed to people picking up their families and then moving to the job. And, and, and so that's, a, that's something that didn't happen 10 years ago, but it's happening much more now. And I don't know how that affects the work of recruiters for migrant education, but that's something that certainly we, we see much more now than we used to see. Very good. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you have lots and lots of, com of comments here, of people saying that it was really helpful. And so thank you very much. Um, we will, I will continue to follow you on your, on your blogs and just um, really grateful for the information that you put out for us and, and how willing you were to share with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take care and good luck, everybody. Stay safe. Yeah, you take care. Thank you.